Welcome to Lesson 2 of the FAA Part 107 Remote Pilot Knowledge Study Course. In Lesson 2, we will be reviewing airspace classifications and the operating requirements and flight restri restrictions within the National Airspace System, also known as NAS. Now, Lesson 2 and Lesson 3 kind of intertwine with each other. Lesson two will focus again on the different airspace classes, but to further define them for you, we will be also using aeronautical sectional charts to show you these same airspaces and define them a little bit better for you. Now, of course, the uh, uh, FAA excuse me, wants remote pilots to understand the various airspace classes within the National Airspace System. And the airspace is basically divided into two categories. You have regulatory and non-regulatory airspace. Now, within these two categories, there are four types of airspace. You have controlled airspace, you have uncontrolled airspace, special use airspace, and what the FAA classifies as other airspace. Now, the National Airspace System, as you can see in this graph, is comprised of a Class A, a Class B, C, D, E, and a Class G airspace. However, Part 107 only requires the knowledge of Classes B through G airspace. And incidentally, there is no F airspace in the United States, just in case you were wondering. But Class B through G airspace all fall under regulatory airspace, which is governed by the FAA. Non-regulatory airspace includes airspace such as prohibited, restricted, warning, military operation, alert areas, and controlled firing areas, where in all those areas the FAA does not enforce. Now, controlled airspace is basically a generic term that covers the different classifications of airspace and defined dimensions within which air traffic control, ATC service, is provided in accordance with that particular airspace classification. Now, controlled airspace that is of concern to the remote pilot are Class B, C, D, and E airspace. Whenever a remote pilot is planning to fly an operation within controlled airspace, the remote pilot must receive FAA authorization before operating in any of the controlled airspaces. So Class B airspace is generally airspace that runs from the surface of the airport up to 10,000 feet mean sea level and surrounds some of the busiest airport uh, such as Chicago O'Hare, Los Angeles and Dallas Fort Worth. Now Class B airspace is controlled airspace and is individually configured based upon an area's natural terrain and man-made objects and consists of a surface area with two or more layers resembling an upside down wedding cake. Now as you can see in the center of this uh, Class B airspace, it extends from the surface and extends outward about five nautical miles and then extends upward to approximately 10,000 feet MSL, mean sea level. And that's on average. Some classes of controlled airspace could extend up to 11,000. It could only extend up to 10,000. And that goes the same with the Class C and Class D airspaces. It, it'll depend on the natural terrain. But the center of this Class uh, B airspace extend outward from the center of the airport about five nautical miles. And again, the altitude can vary. Now, the first larger shelf we see here can begin at roughly 1,000 to 2,000 feet MSL. And then it can extend outward about 10 miles from the center of the airport. And then the second shelf of airspace can begin anywhere between 3,500 and 5,000 feet MSL. And again, will extend up to the top, the ceiling of approximately 10,000 feet MSL and outward about 15 miles from the center of the airport. Now in this class C airspace denoted in the magenta, it too will extend out about five miles from the center of the airport. And then the second shelf will begin roughly at about 1200 feet MSL and 
extend upward to 4,000 feet MSL, and the center of Class C controlled airspace will extend out typically 10 miles from the center of the airport. Class D will be de denoted in an aeronautical sectional chart as a dashed or dotted blue lines, Class D Delta, and it will begin at the surface and extend up to about 2,500 feet MSL. The dotted magenta is a Class E airspace. Now, Class E airspace um, can perhaps be one of the most confusing, and again, we'll go into this in greater detail in a few slides, but I just want to quickly point out that it can either be denoted as a dashed or dotted magenta circle on an aeronautical sectional chart and can extend upward until it runs into the shelf, an overlying shelf of another class airspace, controlled class like Class C. This could be Class E airspace and it can hit the bottom of this Class C shelf. So it can end at 700 feet AGL when it may run into a different type of Class E airspace. This shaded blue is also Class E airspace. And this 14,500 feet MSL Class E airspace, typically found in the western part of the United States at higher elevations. Now here we are looking at a two-dimensional looking downward on this Class B Bravo airspace. And again, it's, d it's denoted uh, on a sectional aeronautical sectional chart in a solid blue lines or symmetrical circles. Not always totally symmetrical, I should point out. Um, but again, the inside the, of the uh, airport, the very center of the airport, in this case, we have Charlotte Douglas International and it's denoted in blue runway icon strips. And um, when you see an airport, they'll either be shown as with these runway patterns, or as we see here is a, a to the Northeast, a blue icon or down to the Southeast magenta. These are all airports. But when you see just the runway patterns, that denotes that the shortest runway at that particular airport is at has a runway greater in length of 8,069 feet. I just like to point some of this stuff out as we go through this, so you're not hit up with it all at once. But again, so the center of the air, the uh, first center of airspace extends outward about five miles from the center of the airport. And again, in this case, this airspace does run from the surface to 10,000 feet. And um, how we determine that is you'll see these fractions in a lot of these uh, shelf shelves of airspace. And there's always, the FAA removes two zeros from the numbers to simplify the airspace. And so this denotes SFC, meaning from the surface up to 10,000 feet MSL. So the center within five mile radius of that airport runs from the surface up to 10,000 feet. The first shelf of airspace typically extends outward about 10 miles, but as I'll point out here on the bottom part, 10 miles, but then if you can see, it cuts out at the top and extends outward a little bit, and then comes around over to the west side of the airport and bends around this little uh, airport. And so this airspace, that first shelf of airspace, runs from 1,800 feet MSL up to 10,000 feet MSL. And then the second shelf of airspace, as denoted here, has a lot of little cutouts through it. There's, there's quite a few different shelves of airspace in this one shelf, so to speak. So as we can see here, I want to point out the air, that airspace, that shelf of airspace cuts around this airport, which by the way, when you see an airport in magenta, it denotes it is a, a airport that does not have an operating control tower, only radio frequencies, which we will get into in a few chapters. 
the star above each of these airports if you see that there's a little star above this airport you can see one of course over at charlotte to the northeast concord regional there's a star this one south of it does not have a star when you see a star that indicates that there's a lighted beacon you may or may not have a, a question on that probably not but i again like to point this out to make these maps less confusing and basically you a better more informed remote pilot the little squares protruding off of the circle simply indicate there's fuel services available for the pilots for the manned aircraft that land there and you'll understand why we kind of need to know how busy a particular airport is is if you are hired to operate your small unmanned aircraft near these airports you need to be aware of the size of the airport and the traffic corresponding traffic around there but this second shelf of airspace in some sections begins at 5,000 feet MSL, again denoted in these like fraction numbers, two zeros missing, and extend upward to a ceiling of 10,000 feet MSL. However, there are a few areas where the lower shelf of the airspace begins at 3,600 feet MSL, and then another area by that little cutout where that airport is over on to the west of Charlotte Douglas begins at 4,000 feet MSL. And again, it begins at various altitudes based on the terrain and other man-made objects in the area and, and traffic uh, departure and approach patterns as well. But there's another shelf of airspace not denoted in the graph on the bottom left. This Charlotte Douglas has uh, gotten to be a pretty busy airport. And um, if you look at the upper left, you can see that sh uh, shelf of airspace extends 30, 30 nautical miles out from the center of the airport. And that shelf airspace begins at 6,000 feet MSL and extend upwards to 10,000 feet MSL. So I also want to point out this is a airport Concord Regional and it is blue so that is telling us it has an operating control tower and it is in a class d airspace delta dash dotted delta airspace and again we're going to review this stuff again and so there'll be i'll be repeating myself a couple of times because i feel it's just easier to absorb this information again between lesson two and lesson three it's pretty much intertwined but I point out this class D Delta airspace uh, because it cuts in. You can see that's why there's part of that cut in there from the class B Bravo airspace. And it is also nestled these magenta circles. Again, we'll be reviewing this class E airspace in a few slides in the next chapter as well. There's several shelves of airspace that a remote pilot would have to be concerned with if they were hypothetically hired to inspect these little what, uh, obstacles, also likely cell towers or broadcasting towers. Again, we will review all of this in greater detail as we proceed through these slides, but I point this out to try to make this less confusing overall to you as we progress through this lesson. Now here we have class C airspace shown in the solid magenta lines of circles. And it is generally again, airspace that runs from the center of the airport outward five miles. And it surrounds airports that have an operational control tower. It's also serviced by, you know, radar approach control. They can also have a certain number of instrument flight rules or IFR operations. It again services um, somewhat busy airports and passenger aircraft. Uh, like all controlled airspace, Class C is individually tailored usually consists of a surface area, again, within a five nautical mile, mile radius from the center of the airport. And again, extends upward approximately 4,000 feet. But 
like this airport, it runs from the surface, but extends upward to 4,100 feet MSL. So it extends 100 feet higher, likely due to some natural terrain. I'll also point out again that this has a blue striped icon for the airport runway icons, which indicate instantly tells us that the shortest runway is greater than 8,069 feet in length. So the first shelf of airspace, 10 miles outward from the center of the airport, and it starts, the lower shelf starts at 1,300 feet MSL and extends upward to 4,100 feet MSL. Now, I also want to point out that this Class C airspace is sitting on top of this shaded magenta circle, and that is Class E airspace. We'll go into Class E airspace, of course, in a few slides, but I just want to point that out. If there was no Class E airspace under this, you would just see solid magenta circle here. Also want to point out another class D delta dashed dotted delta airspace to the southeast. And class D airspace, the ceiling of class D airspace will always be shown in a number inside a blue bracket like this 25. And again, there are two zeros missing. So the ceiling of this class D delta airspace is 2,500 feet. So it runs from the surface up to 2,500 feet. Now above 2,500 feet, because part of this class D airspace is sitting within the class C airspace, class C airspace would take over from the top of that class D airspace and continue up to 4,100 feet MSL. So here are is a group of what is called are called obstacles. And again, these are likely cell towers or broadcasting towers. The reason it is important to know these various classes of controlled airspace is if you were hypothetically hired to inspect the top of these cell towers, let's call them, um, you would need to know obviously uh, how tall they are and whether they're protruding into any controlled airspace. To the bottom right, you see a number and a number in parentheses. You see 1,545 feet. That indicates the height of the tallest obstacle or tower there, MSL. The number on the bottom is AGL, above ground level. So we can see we're not very high above sea level there. If you were hired to inspect the top of this tower, you're allowed to fly your small unmanned aircraft within a 400 foot radius of that tower to the top of it. You would be legally allowed to fly up to 1,532 feet and actually plus 400 feet if you needed to, providing it doesn't penetrate into any controlled airspace. Since we know this shelf of airspace Class E begins at 700 feet AGL. Never mind this 1,300 feet shelf of Class C airspace MSL. These towers are all protruding into this controlled airspace. So before you would be able to fly and inspect those towers, you would need FAA approval. So here we have some class D Delta airspace, as we've been discussing a few times before. Delta D dashed blue dotted line, however you want to remember that. But class D airspace again is generally the airspace that runs from the surface at the airport up to 2,500 feet MSL. It surrounds many airports that have an operational control tower 
and it again typically extends outward about five nautical miles from the center of the airport. Now in, in this particular group of airports, which is actually near my neck of the woods, you cannot practically step outside your door and fly a drone commercially without having to get FAA approval. But what we have here are three airports, actually each airport on the outside are military airports, Langley Air Force Base and Fort Eustis, the one in the center. There's a commercial airport, Newport News, Williamsburg International. But in this controlled D, Class D airspace, one must obtain FAA approval. Now the ceiling again, we can see is 2,500 feet MSL as denoted in the number in these brackets. So this airspace, controlled airspace runs from the surface up to 2,500 feet. And also I want to point out to the southeast, there's another commercial airport as well as another military base. There is class D airspace that has a ceiling of up to 2,000 feet. So that particular area of airspace runs from the surface up to 1,999 feet MSL. And in a few slides uh, next lesson, I believe we, we will review that in greater detail so I can show you how that Class D works in conjunction with the Class C airspace it, it's sitting within. And then I just want to point out there's some Class E airspace attached off to this Class D airspace just to provide a little more clearance uh, for approach and takeoff. You can see this runway on this Fort Eustace, how it runs diagonally. So that just to provide a little more approach and landing. Now you can see here that the Class E airspace uh, it is pretty predominant throughout the nation. This is just one small section of an aeronautical sectional chart. And this is taken from the east side of the United States. You don't really see any Class E airspace with shaded blue. Again, you'll see that primarily out in the western United States at higher elevations, but it makes up a lot of our airports. Now, the little blue, green, and red dots in the center I just want to point out is there's a website called AirMap, uh, skyvector.com and airmap.com. Skyvector.com is a great resource and it'll show you a lot of information. And so these dots will provide you with a lot of helpful information. When you hover your mouse over them or click on them, you'll obtain airport data information, detailed airport data information, and other important information such as temporary flight restrictions, notice to airmen. Again, we'll be reviewing this uh, notice to airmen and what temporary flight restrictions are in a few uh, lessons. So here we have a closer look at some Class E airspace and the dotted or dashed circle, magenta circle, uh, is Class E controlled airspace that runs from the surface up to the next overlying airspace. Now in this case, there is no overlying airspace. So it does extend up to 17,999 feet, basically up to the bottom of class A airspace. That is all controlled airspace. However, also what we see here is class E airspace, again shown in the shaded magenta circles. And inside that, the airspace begins at 700 feet. So inside, say here over to the uh, left, we see Wallace Airport. All of the airspace from the surface to 699 feet AGL is Class G uncontrolled airspace. If you were going to inspect any of these towers or obstacles here, um, at 305 feet, this particular one AGL, you could easily inspect the top of it with your small unmanned aircraft and you would not need FAA authorization because you'd be well underneath that 700 foot AGL uh, shelf, the bottom of that airspace shelf.
Now again, on the outside edge and everything in between, it's Class E airspace that begins at 1,200 feet AGL and extends upward until it runs into the next airspace. Now again, if you were hired to inspect that little group of uh, towers there, you can see the number in parentheses is the AGL height of the tower, 406 feet AGL. You could inspect that tower without running into the lower shelf of that Class E controlled airspace. Now on the other hand, if you were hired to inspect this tower inside this controlled airspace, you would need FAA authorization not just to inspect that tower, but to fly anywhere within that controlled airspace. Now this is also Class E airspace, controlled airspace, uh, shown in the uh, faded blue box. And this is airspace, again, mostly found out in the Western United States at higher elevations. And uh, this airspace is Class G airspace from the surface up to, but not including, 14,500 feet MSL. And outside of the area of that blue faded box, it's Class G airspace from the surface up to, but not including, 1,200 feet MSL. So Class G airspace is, again, the uncontrolled airspace um, that runs from the surface typically up to 1,200 feet AGL. And it is basically airspace that has not been designated and it extends from the surface to the base of the next overlying airspace. Typically Class E, but it could also be uh, Class B airspace it runs into. If you look here, if you were flying just seven miles away from the center of this airport in this Class Bravo B controlled air space, you would be in Class G and you would not need FAA authorization to fly as long as you did not penetrate into the bottom shelf of that Class B airspace. And so the Class um, B airspace is shown again in the solid blue line uh, on an aeronautical sectional chart. and typically extends from the surface up to 10,000 feet MSL. The Class C airspace, controlled airspace, is shown in with a solid magenta line or circle and typically runs from the surface up to 4,000 feet MSL. And Class D delta airspace, controlled airspace, typically runs from the surface up to 2,500 feet MSL and is shown as in a dashed or segmented uh, line or circle. And again, the, um, the Class uh, E airspace, which is our most um, challenging airspace to learn. And again, don't worry, you will learn this. We will be reviewing it in the next lesson again and going over it in greater detail. But again, the Class E can be shown in the dashed magenta lines or circles and runs from the surface and it can extend all the way up to the bottom of a Class A airspace. It can also begin at 700 feet AGL and run upward uh, when shown in the shaded magenta circle. And again, it can also start at 1200 feet AGL or 14,500 feet MSL and extend upward. Now special use airspace uh, or special areas of operation, SAO, is the designation for airspace in which certain activities must be confined or where limitations may be imposed on aircraft operations that are not part of those activities. So special use airspace usually consists of prohibited areas, restricted areas, warning areas, uh, MOAs, or what's called military operation areas, alert areas, or even controlled firing areas. Now, prohibited areas are areas that contain airspace of defined dimensions. Now, where the flight of an aircraft is prohibited for security or other reasons associated with the national welfare. 
Now this type of area is charted uh, with a P followed by a number, as you can see in these images, such as a P-49 or a P-67. Uh, a few of the examples of prohibited areas in our nation would be Camp David or Washington DC or even Kenny Buck Port. Um, restricted areas are areas where operations are hazardous to non-participating aircraft. And uh, restricted areas are marked with uh, wired or hashed lines as shown below. Uh, they denote the existence of unusual and often invisible hazards uh, to aircraft, including the small unmanned aircraft. It could contain artillery firing, aerial gunnery, or guided missiles. Now flying within these restricted areas without authorization from the using or controlling agency would obviously be pretty hazardous to your aircraft. Uh, and the restricted areas are charted with an R followed by a number uh, in the example shown below. Now it's permissible to fly without authorization in a restricted area, but for obvious reasons, it is recommended that you do not. Warning areas are similar in nature to restricted areas. However, the United States government does not have sole jurisdiction over that airspace. Now, a warning area is airspace of defined dimensions and extends three nautical miles outward from the coast of the United States and contains activity that may be hazardous to non-participating aircraft. So, the purpose of such areas is to warn non-participating pilots of the potential danger and the area may be located over domestic or international waters or both and is designated with a W followed by a number again as shown in the um, graphs below. Um, in, near my neck of the woods, uh, Southeast Virginia, there's almost a dozen different various military bases um, in the area. So there is a lot of warning and restricted and prohibited areas to be aware of for uh, remote pilots here. Military operation areas or MOAs consist of airspace with defined vertical and lateral limits established for the purpose of separating certain military training activities from instrument flight rules traffic or IFR traffic. Now, whenever an MOA is being used, non-participating IFR traffic may be cleared through an MOA if IFR separation can be provided by air traffic control. Now, otherwise, ATC reroutes or restricts non-participating traffic. And although the ATC manages the national airspace system, each pilot is responsible for collision avoidance in a military operation area. Now a controlling agency phone number as well as a radio frequency denoted within a sectional chart can provide the information for remote pilots to use. Rem MOAs are also depicted on sectional charts of VFR terminal areas, IFR and route low altitude charts as well. MOAs are named and not numbered such as in the examples below again Phelps A MOA and Columbus 2 MOA. Um, also note in the red rectangle, the status, the request status box, it has a frequency of 119.75 that one could dial into with a VHF radio for additional information about that particular MOA. Now alert areas are depicted on aeronautical charts to inform non-participating pilots of areas that may contain a high volume of pilot training or an unusual type of aerial activity. Pilots should exercise extreme caution in alert areas and all activity within an alert area shall be conducted in accordance with regulations without waiver. Pilots of participating aircraft or pilots transiting the area, as well as SUAS, shall be equally responsible for collision avoidance. Alert areas are depicted with an A followed by a number such as A-531 and A-292 as shown in these images below. 
Now, controlled firing areas, or CFAs, contain activities that could be hazardous to non-participating aircraft if not conducted in a controlled environment. The difference between CFAs and other special use airspace is that activities must be suspended when a spotter aircraft, radar, or ground lookout position indicates an aircraft might be approaching the area. Now, there is no need to chart CFAs since they do not cause a non-participating aircraft to change it, its flight path, and they will not appear in Notice to Airmen notices either, no TAMs. A local airport advisory, LAAs, uh, is an advisory service provided by flight service facilities, which are located on the landing airport using a discrete ground-to-air frequency or the tower frequency when the tower is closed. LAA services include local airport advisories, automated weather reporting with voice broadcasting, and a continuous automated surface observing system, ASOS, or an automated weather observing station, also known as an AWOS. The display data or other continuous direct reading instruments or manual observations available to the specialist. Now we'll be reviewing the airport broadcasting frequencies in a later lesson, but below are a few images that show an ASOS and an AWOS airport frequencies. Now, military training routes, or MTRs, are used by the military for conducting low-altitude, high-speed flight training. Now, typically, routes above 1,500 feet AGL are flown under instrument flight rules, or IFR rules, and the routes flown under 1,500 feet AGL are flown under visual flight rules, or VFR. On a sectional chart, MTRs are identified as IFR, and VFR, instrument flight rules and visual flight rules, followed by a number. And this number is displayed on a straight line with an arrow. Now, MTRs with four numbers denote routes flown at 1500 feet AGL and below. At such a low altitude, this can obviously present challenges to an unmanned aircraft. And MTRs with three numbers or less denote routes that are flown above 1500 feet AGL. The numbers following IR or VR do not depict altitude. They just will indicate whether it is above 1500 feet AGL or below 1500 feet AGL. Now, I want to also review isogonic lines. And isogonic lines are depicted in this image as the dashed straight magenta line labeled 9 degrees west. Now, an isogonic line indicates the magnetic variation or difference between true north and magnetic north. We touched on military VFR and IFR traffic, but it warrants going over again as it will likely appear on your knowledge exam. The line indicated as VR41, VR1754, and IR760 are military training routes, MTRs, to conduct high-speed training missions using either visual flight rules or instrument flight rules. Again, the numbers following the letters do not depict true altitude, but rather they simply tell you if flights will be flown above 1500 feet AGL or below 1500 feet AGL. Routes at or below 1500 feet AGL are indicated by a four digit number and flights above 1500 AGL are typically indicated by three or fewer numbers. It warrants pointing that out again because it will be on your knowledge exam. Now just to review a couple of icons here, here we see a parachute a jump um, icon. Parachute jump aircraft operations are published in the chart supplement US, formerly the airport facility directory and uh, sites that are used frequently are depicted on the aeronautical sectional chart. One could expect to see uh, parachute jumpers uh, in the area. Published VFR routes are for transitioning around, under, or through some complex airspace. 
Now terms such as VFR flyway, VFR corridor, class B airspace, VFR transition route, and terminal area VFR route have been applied to such routes. Now these routes are generally found on VFR terminal area planning charts. Terminal radar service areas or TRSAs are areas where pilots can receive additional radar services. The primary airports within the TRSA becomes Class D airspace and participation in TRSA services is voluntary. However, pilots operating under VFR are encouraged to contact air traffic control or radar approach control to take advantage of the TRSA service. The remaining portion of the TRSA overlies other controlled airspace, which is normally Class E airspace beginning at 700 or 1200 feet AGL and established to transition to or from the en route terminal environment. TRSAs are depicted on VFR sectional charts and terminal area charts with a solid gray circular line and altitudes for each segment as well. The Class D portion is charted with a blue segmented line and the outermost ring is Class E airspace. National Security Areas NSAs consist of airspace of defined vertical and lateral dimensions established at locations where there is a requirement for increased security and safety of ground facilities. A flight in an NSA may be temporarily prohibited and these are announced via NOTAMs. Pilots are requested to voluntarily avoid flying through these depicted areas. Now, with all flight operations, the remote pilot should refer to current aeronautical charts and other navigational tools to determine position and related airspace. And apps that can provide this kind of information are through airmap.com or the FAA UAS data maps. Now, as previously touched upon, Notice to Airmen, or a NOTAM, is a notice containing information concerning the establishment, condition, or change in any component, facility, service, procedure, or hazard within the national airspace system. The timely knowledge of such information is essential to personnel concerned with flight operations. Now, since the information cannot be known sufficiently in advance to publicize by other means, it's imperative for the remote pilot to check NOTAMs before each flight to determine if there are any applicable TFRs or temporary flight restrictions that might affect your flight operation. There are multiple online resources for a remote pilot to use to obtain NOTAMs, but the FAA's exam question will prefer you answer stating 1-800-WX-BRIEF.COM is the best resource to use. Now, other applicable sources are skyvector.com, FAA, UAS data maps, uh, FAA.gov, and PilotWeb as well. Now, temporary flight restrictions or TFRs are issued using NOTAMs and are clearly labeled in bold red letters or are outlined on a sectional chart. Now, the TFR will state the nature of the restriction, such as an aerial demonstration or perhaps a visit by a VIP, then followed by the effective days and times the airspace will be affected. The FAA may approve SUAS operations in a temporary flight restriction area with prior authorization and approval. And some TFRs like around Disneyland or Disney World are not so temporary and will show up as pretty much being temporary 24-7. So some of the purposes for establishing a TFR uh, to protect persons and property in the air or on the surface from an existing or imminent event uh, to provide a safe environment for the operation of disaster relief aircraft, to prevent an unsafe congestion of sightseeing aircraft above an incident or event, to protect declared national disasters for humanitarian reasons in the state of Hawaii, to protect the president, vice president, or again, other important public figures, and to provide a safe environment for space agency operations. 
Now, using NOTAMs to ensure flight safety, in this image taken from skyvector.com, you'll see a caution box informing all pilots to be aware of an unmarked balloon that's located about three nautical miles southeast of the Elizabeth City Airport. You'll see that box on the bottom right corner says caution unmarked balloon on cable. Now the, the box clearly tells us how to obtain additional information regarding this unmarked balloon by checking NOTAMs. And again, the best way to check the NOTAMs would be by using the WXBrief.com, the 1-800-WXBrief.com uh, website. Now this caution box informs pilots there's an unmarked balloon on a, on a cable up to, that's uh, 3,008 feet above MSL. And we're mentioning this because this question may be presented to you on the final exam as well. So lastly, uh, obtaining airspace authorization or waivers. Now currently, remote pilots must request authorization to fly in a controlled airspace directly with the FAA. Now, pilots are no longer permitted to call their local air traffic control directly and verbally request approval. Some may be doing that. And we're actually kind of curious if there are some air traffic control centers providing information or authorization. But the process, uh, the ATC should be referring you to the FAA dronezone.faa.gov website. And this is the same website where you register your small unmanned aircraft. But the process to initiate an authorization to fly in a controlled airspace should be done through the website. The low altitude authorization and notification capability system um, known as Lance is an industry developed application with the goal of providing drone operators near real time processing of airspace notification and automatic approval of requests to fly in controlled airspace that are below the approved altitudes. Now this is as of 2018, a new system that's been rolling out and the airspace data is will be provided through the UAS facility maps and these maps will show the maximum altitude around an airport where the FAA may authorize operations under the small UAS rule. Now, although this will likely not be on your final knowledge exam, we just feel it warrants mentioning. Um, and again, in early 2018, the FAA officially announced the nationwide expansion of the Lance program, where digital airspace authorization will be rolled out to nearly 300 air traffic control facilities that represent approximately 500 airports across the United States. So Lance authorization to fly in a controlled airspace should become pretty easy digitally and most importantly available almost immediately. Now, if you're not in the Lance area, and I believe they're starting out in the Western United States first at some of the larger metropolitan airports, um, the air traffic control again should be referring you to apply for flight authorization via the FAA drone zone uh, website. So let's move on to 12 practice questions and answers here. So the purpose of a military training route is to allow the military to conduct, if you remember that was low altitude, high speed training. Remember the, the icons and the numbers VR or IR followed by a three or four digit number. According to Title 14, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 107, a remote pilot planning to operate within controlled Class C airspace must. So if it's in a controlled airspace, the remote pilot must receive authorization from the FAA. A blue segmented circle on a sectional chart depicts which type of class air airspace. Segmented or also dashed delta blue and that would be class D airspace. Which group of airspace is considered all controlled airspace? Well, we know Class B Bravo airspace is controlled airspace. We know Class C is controlled airspace. D is controlled airspace. But 
Class G is not controlled airspace, so the correct answer is B, C, and D. The NAS defines airspace under which two categories? So the National Airspace System defines airspace under two categories, and that is regulatory and non-regulatory. Now, controlled Class C Charlie airspace typically, on average, includes airspace from? Well, the giveaway question here is, remember, all this Class C controlled airspace is measured in a MSL. So, the correct answer is from the surface to 4,000 feet MSL, typically. Controlled Class B Bravo airspace typically includes airspace from, and we gave another one away here, from the surface to 10,000 feet mean sea level. Notice to airmen are published by the FAA to announce, and this is in part, I should say, to announce. You may get a question like this, and again, the answer will always be the more true answer. Now, although there's several answers to this question, the really only correct answer is temporary flight restrictions, but again, it could be for other reasons as well. Temporary flight restrictions would cover important people coming to the area, president. An area that represents an unusual and often invisible hazard to aircraft, such as artillery firing or gunnery, is a prohibited area, a warning, or a restricted area. And remember that is a restricted area. It is restricted. A remote pilot would not necessarily need approval to fly within that restricted area, but for obvious reasons, highly recommended you do not fly within an area that has artillery firing or gunnery. I wouldn't. And lastly, in part, notice to airmen provide information pertaining to announcements for not for sudden weather changes and changes to controlled airspace won't change really. So it's military exercises, flights of important people coming into an area, closed runways, exercises, etc. If you were hired to take photos in a prohibited area, are you allowed to fly your drone within that prohibited area? In an area that's prohibited, it is no, never permitted to fly within a prohibited area. And lastly, a solid magenta circle on a sectional chart depicts which type of controlled airspace. And class B Bravo is blue and class C Charlie is magenta. All right, awesome. Good job. Congrats on completing lesson two. If you want to press on and continue with lesson three, which we will review aeronautical sectional charts. It's the two-dimensional view of the airspace we kind of just reviewed and then some. And we'll also go into latitude and longitudes and a bunch of other great stuff. So press on and congrats.